Now, uh, this afternoon, uh, I want to talk about Middle Platonism and um, make a beginning in talking about Neoplatonism. Um, Middle Platonism is not represented at all in our anthology and is not discussed by Stumpf. Um, I'm daring to introduce it, however, because as we will see in a couple of days, it's crucially important in understanding the development of Christian thought, um, the development of theological positions and controversies, and the relationship between Christianity and the later Neoplatonism. Okay? Um, you can think of Middle Platonism as um, representing the first two centuries AD, the first two centuries. And uh, think of it as an amalgam of Platonism with two other streams of thought at that time. Stoicism, particularly with its emphasis on the logos. Logos in the sense of the divine law that orders uh, the natural world. Um, also, uh, Neopythagoreanism, and that in view of its concept of emanation. And uh, we want to see what this is and uh, how it all comes together. Well, let's, uh, let's start with this. That uh, at that juncture in history, uh, there were strong tendencies towards dualism of one sort or another. Uh, we've seen dualistic interpretations of Plato, in which matter is presumably some primal uncreated chaos into which form comes. A dualistic interpretation of Plato, with implications for the problem of evil. There is a much more definite kind of dualism in various kinds of Gnosticism of that time. Various kinds of Gnosticism, which explicitly regarded matter as evil, or at least the source of evil. Mind or reason as good. And there's some um, comments about dualism and reactions to it in that uh, piece that's on reserve about the divine logos and the goodness of creation that I mentioned last time. But um, in addition to the Platonism and the Gnosticism, in Stoicism, there is, of course, what um, back in Heraclitus we call the double aspect theory where the Stoics uh, viewed nature as a uh, process of change, and some of it likened the basic stuff to fiery vapor, like Heraclitus. But the other side is, of course, the logos, the orderedness, the law-governed nature of things. And, and so various tendencies towards dualism. Now, what Middle Platonism does decisively, for the future of Platonism, decisively, is to push from dualism in a monistic direction. Not two ultimate realities, or two irreconcilable aspects to reality but one inclusive reality from which variety is derived and to which it returns. Moving from dualism then to monism. How did they do it? They did it by means of the Neopythagorean emphasis on emanations. Now, Neopythagoreanism itself developed with um, Platonic ingredients and Stoic ingredients. And in some writers, there is virtually no distinction made between certain Neopythagoreans and um, Middle Platonists. In fact, I think of one whose name is Albinus, who by some writers is called a Neo-Pythagorean and others a Middle Platonist. The similarity is there. But what the Pythagoreans did was to conceive of a um, hierarchy of beings with varying degrees of being and perfection. From God all the way down to the other extreme, non-being. A hierarchy with all sorts of intermediary beings. In fact, even between, shall we say, the human realm and the divine realm, intermediary beings. Various kinds of powers with various degrees of perfection and imperfection. This, uh, this notion of a hierarchy of being becomes, in fact, the conceptual model that governs the Middle Ages. This is where it comes from, that hierarchical notion, which uh, found expression in the structure of the church and of society, as well as in philosophy and literature, and so on and so forth, and has carried over into some Christian thinking to this day. Um, it's a hierarchy of being in which there are no gaps. And so um, we talk of the principle of plenitude. The hierarchy is filled up. There are no places to let. There are no vacancies. Every possible degree of being is taken by something that exists. Okay. Now, that notion has a, um, a long history. And uh, you may be interested sometime in looking up a book by A.O. Lovejoy. It's an older book, about um, oh, 60 years, 70 years old now. Uh, A.O. Lovejoy, a book called The Great Chain of Being. The Great Chain of Being. And particularly those of you in um, history and literature uh, who will want to have some sense of where this notion comes from that plays such a role in, um, in Western thought um, may want to take note of that book for um, some time to read. Uh, Ail Lovejoy's great chain of being. Well, this um, hierarchy of things is an arrangement that enables them to preserve the transcendence of God. Uh, that is to say, God is transcendent in the sense that he is qualitatively, qualitatively, far beyond this earth and earthly creatures, humans included. But at the same time as it pre preserves the transcendence, it facilitates the imminence of God. You know, keeping both these things in balance is, uh, is one of the issues that um, arose in Greek thought. Plato's God so transcendent, 
out of touch with earthly beings. You see. Aristotle's God, beyond the outer perimeter of the universe, and in terms of efficient causation, unable to do anything among earthly beings. You see. Uh, but um, they were trying to preserve the immanence by virtue of the Logos doctrine taken over from the Stoics. Now, remember that doctrine. Um, for the Stoics, the Logos was defining reason, probably impersonal. But some rational, unchanging, rational principle that embraces and permeates everything in existence. So that there are seeds of the Logos, Logoi Spermaticoi. Seeds of the Logos in every particular thing. Now, if that's the case, then you see there are these seeds of the Logos running all the way down. Everywhere. It is by virtue of the Logos that the divine being is imminent in every natural thing and every earthly process. Imminent insofar as these Logoi Spermaticoi Logos spermaticoi are equated with the imminent forms. Now you're expecting me to say of the Aristotelian tradition, and I'm going to say of the later Platonic tradition because there are hints at it in the Timaeus. You see, the, the forms which brought into the receptacle form physical things. So that it's by virtue of the forms becoming Logoi spermaticoi, seeds of the divine Logos, okay. that you have the imminence as well as the transcendence. And consequently, evil can now be seen as dependent on one stage in the whole hierarchy of being. That is to say, down here, a dog simply doesn't have the degree of perfection which is appropriate to the human being. Nor does the human being have the degree of perfection appropriate to higher beings. But, for the same token, among human beings there are some who, who do not um, live in accordance with that logos, as according to the Stoic ethic we have to live. Uh, human beings who do not, putting it in platonic language, conform to the form of their human existence. They don't achieve the actuality of that inherent capacity. And evil, then, is a privation. A privation of good. It's a privation of the intended good, of the form, in actualization. So you, you can see the way in which um, breaking with dualism and monism is now involved. What you have, in fact, um, may sound like pantheism. Because if the Logos is divine, if the Logos, that is to say, is the highest emanation from the divine being, if the Logos is divine and permeates all things, then it sounds at least as if the divine is in everything, and insofar as matter has no separate existence, the divine becomes everything. It's a kind of pantheism, yeah, which was another problem later on that had to be wrestled with. Middle Platonism, because of the Stoic influence, Neoplatonism were pretty pantheistic. When Christianity assimilated Middle Platonism, as many Christians did, they found they had to make distinctions between God and creation which were not inherent in this emanation theory. And the distinction that finally was made was that instead of emanation, creation ex nihilo is the way to conceive the distinction. Okay. What is emanation? Well, the word itself means an outflowing. An outflowing of being. The analogies used are of water streaming from a fountain, light streaming from the sun. You see? So if the natural world is an emanation of the divine being, it's of the very stuff of which the divine being is. Nature comes ex deo out of the divine being, rather than ex nihilo. So uh, what begins to take shape on the horizon now, and it's on the horizon still, is a distinction between dualism, okay, Dualism as in the Gnostics, pantheism as in the Neoplatonists, and theism as in Christian thought. Dualism, where things are formed out of eternal matter, ex materia. Pantheism with things formed ex deo, out of the very substance of God. And theism with creation, ex nihilo, out of nothing at all. Giving rise to three very different worldviews. And in a real way, the history of the first five, six centuries of Christian thought is the history of trying to make those distinctions clearly. Now, um, one, uh, one or two other notes about this uh, Middle Platonism. Uh, I was saying that it enabled them to affirm both the transcendence and the imminence of God. Uh, that is to say, God, by virtue of the Logos, is an imminent formative principle within all things. But by the same token, notice that if the forms are seeds of the Logos, and the Logos is the emanating reason of God, then the ultimate status of the forms is as reasons in the mind of God. You see? They are the eternal ideas in the mind of God. And I was hinted at in the time uh, The Demiurge, who with the forms in mind, you remember, wanted everything to be as good as possible. And in the uh, Middle Platonism, the forms then become ideas in the mind of God, so that God now is not just the formal cause, and the final cause for the sake of which nature exists, but also the efficient cause because it's through the operation of the Logoi Spermaticoi that nature comes into being. 
fought. Now, the, um, the Logos, then, is the following. You have God, you have a Logos as the highest emanation, known as, let me get the exact uh, wording of it, um, uh, God known as uh, Proto-Theos, the first God, and the Logos known as Deuteros Theos, the second God. Okay. So that here in these yeah, pagan middle Platonists, there is emerging a distinction of beings within the divine Godhead. You see? In fact, there were one or two of them who added to the divine Logos the world soul, giving us Prototheos, Deuteros Theos, and number three. This is a pre-Christian conception of divine trinity in a purely pagan context. Okay. And it's this formulation of it which provided a conceptual tool for the early church in beginning to formulate the doctrine of the trinity. And we'll see more of that later on. Oh, it um, should be said that the motivation behind the spread of Middle Platonism was thoroughly pagan. In fact, the Roman emperor Justinian in the uh, third century attempted to popularize Middle Platonism in order to save pagan religion because it made room for the pagan gods as other intermediary beings. You see, in addition to God, Prototheos, Logos, you have all sorts of other intermediary beings superior to human beings. These are the pagan deities. So you've got all the room for pagan religion to be a popularized allegorical way of talking about these intermediary beings. In fact, um, the pagans weren't the only ones. Uh, we'll be reading next week about Philo of Alexandria, the Jewish philosopher, who it's often said was a Platonist. Yes, he was a middle Platonist. And he too conceived of Logos, well, so, in precisely these middle Platonist terms. Okay. So the influence of it is significant. Um, this, uh, this developing thing is a, is a fascinating story. I had a professor in graduate school who um, one time in a seminar um, declared that, um, I forget the context, he, uh, I think he was talking about ethics and the necessity of having some grounding for objective moral values, and said that um, it was this which forced him to conclude there is some sort of a personal deity. Um, and um, somebody asked him, uh, what sort of a personal deity? Whereupon he said, well, some kind of a Trinitarian meaning. And the um, wise guy, chip on shoulder graduate student in the class, and there were always one or two of them at least. Why on earth that? To which his reply was, well, they worked through the problem of the one and the many in the Godhead once in the ancient years. We don't have to go through all that again. Reference? Precisely this debate. If you want to overcome the gap between Plato's good, objective value, personified as God, and this world of time, space, how are you going to do it? And the middle Platonists saw that this could be done most effectively in... Um, uh, having uh, Yah, Deuteros Theos, uh, that um, immanentizes the good within nature. And this was picked up by the early church in the debate on the Trinity, as we'll see. Yes. And so the, uh, the philosophical basis for some sort of Trinitarian view emerged before the Christian debate on the Trinity, which is very interesting. Well, um, uh, you, you'll see um, something more of that in that article on the Divine Logos, which is on reserve. Now, uh, the thing that we want to see now is that it's this development which um, fed into the later emergence in the third century of Neoplatonism. And there there's an interesting story, a story that we'll pick up on again um, after we're through with Neoplatonism because of the individual who uh, plays the role in this. Um, the personalities are usually cited in terms of the beginnings of Neoplatonism are Ammonius Sanus, Porphyry, and Plotinus. Plotinus, by any account, is the most important name to remember. Because um, he wrote um, a series of treaties known as the Iliads, literally six sets of nine essays, uh, called the Nines in the way that they've been preserved, the Iliads, the Nines, six Iliads, um, purporting to report on Porphyry's teaching, though usually taken to be largely his own. 